So we had a request to do a little bit more training on JKM, um, and, but I'm going to go over first sort of the, the thinking again behind this sort of layout that we did, the reorientation of everything. Um, and one of the funny things I like to say is that uh, Joseph Wolf plus George Catlin equals Carl Rungus. And so that relates the American art side and the European art side to the two different influences that made Carl Rungus who he was. So that's why it's great if you're doing a tour you, you know, do the intro with the national parks and how important that was and why we're here. And then you come to this point and you could either go into here first or into there first. Mm -hmm. But it's good to do both of these and then do Rungus, since Rungus is kind of at the end of both of these sequences. And to bring sort of the European roots and the uh, wild America stuff together in the Person of Carl Rungus uh, makes a really nice little tour, and then going from Rungus into modernism, you say, "What were other people doing at the same time that Rungus was out in the, you know, Canadian Rockies?" Well, here's what other people were doing in terms of different art styles, different movements, not uh, kind of what not, or that's just different than, than Rungus and what he was doing. Would you say the names that we could read? Okay, so George Catlin. Famous American artist explorer Joseph Wolf, who is uh, paint that huge uh, bird painting right there, uh, influenced by Charles Darwin, survival of the fittest, natural selection, um, that emphasis on getting out into nature as being super important. So you've got the adventurous George Catlin side, the scientific get out into nature side over there, and they all come together. Thanks. So it's one way to do that, and I'm hoping that if we ever have time to do the audio tour, we'll kind of bring all that together in a rumpus focused audio tour that explains why these two galleries really help build up to a nice story about rumpus and where he comes from. Um, so to get back to JKM, uh, yeah, if you go through the intro, talk about national parks, Talk, you could you know mention that they became pretty quickly refuges for wildlife, not necessarily for Native Americans. That might help play into some of the themes that happen in here. Um, but as you're making this choice between going to European side or American side, you could come here first and talk about these two paintings. And we hung them here because you've got great European painter Edwin Landseer on this side, representing Europe, and uh, this beautiful Tate painting over here. Uh, he was a Brit, but then came over to the United States and painted mostly in the Adirondacks. So this, there's this great influence that happens. Um, a lot of American art is obviously influenced by the European art traditions that came before it. And so if you just look at these two, you can see there's a lot of similarities in what they're doing this grand, sublime, beautiful landscape populated with wild stags um, is a theme that started with Landseer, started in Europe, but then also obviously translated to how people felt about America and the American wilderness. So, if you took your group here, talked about Europe versus America, Europe and America, then you could go into that gallery or into this gallery before going into one, because it's up to you. We're going to go in here. Um, and I do, um, if, I, if I am confusing in what I'm saying, I'm just trying basically to follow the trajectory as presented in the big section text. So that would help you get a more succinct, perhaps, version of what I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, come into New Frontiers Wildlife in uh, American Art and start off on a really hopeful note in the early 1800s with Peaceable Kingdom, um, where you've got this vision of uh, peace on earth and peace in heaven, right? The um, 
William Penn to sign a treaty with the Native Americans back here. There's a peaceful world happening with all the animals. And it's this very hopeful sense that as uh, settlers move across the West, there will be, uh, you know, wonderful, um, wonderful things will happen. So we know that that didn't necessarily happen, depending <laughs> on who you were. So there's a very sad element to this whole story. But you start off with this peaceful, hopeful vision, and which is also reflected in this little display right here of smaller landscapes, mostly landscapes with creatures in them. Um, this is kind of the epitome of that idea of manifest destiny. This painting represents that. You're looking at a stream with some deer, and in the background, which here can represent in the future, there's a golden glow of uh, this wonderful promise that's all that's out there is just waiting for you to come out and take it. There's, we're living in this land of uh, natural beauty, natural bounty. It's all right there just beyond the trees, and all you have to do is go out there and get it. Um, that's kind of a, a very classic. Uh, there's many of these paintings that show that kind of vision of what uh, North America could be, especially if you were a, a European settler and you were thinking of moving out west. Um, pieces like this, like Albert Bierstadt, this tiny one, also show you, look at this beautiful landscape that's out there, just waiting to be discovered by you. Um, and notice, um, and this is where, when you talk about uh, national parks becoming refuges for wild animals and not for Native Americans, Especially in what we have, this is untrammeled land, right? It's just the animals and the nature and all the stuff that's out there. There's not any Native Americans out there to worry about. It's just, you know, you can go out there. Here's this beautiful land populated with creatures. Fantastic. It's all for you. Um, and then we go to, instead of exactly chronologically, we go more geographically. So we're starting on the East Coast, Eastern sort of civilization, and then we're moving around into westward exploration. So a vision of the East that you would have had is a more um, settled, at this point, civilized kind of vision of nature and of wildlife. Um, and so you can also, in this section, if you think about um, the people who would have been collecting these, upper class, middle class, think about the time period in which these were painted, it was a time of uh, urbanization and of changing gender roles because there were so many people who were moving in from the country into the city, roles were changing, people were doing different things. So a lot of these were used to reinforce more traditional sense of appropriate roles. So. This is a beautiful family portrait. Who's the dominant figure in this? The male. The male, right? There's the nurturing mom down here with the babies, etc. It's not, um, yeah, it's not rocket science. And then we've talked about this a lot because this was in the previous in installation as the heroic male, the epitome of the wilderness. If you were a, a guy and you had a big desk and you had this behind you, that sort of connotes a certain sense of power onto you. A traditional male uh, male general. Then this one too also does the same thing in a humorous way. But here's these two, this couple, which we assume is a male and a female, uh, asking for permission from the village elder to marry. So uh, we've got nothing really challenging uh, traditional gender roles here. Um, and then you've also got this. This is a pretty peaceful. Uh, vision of what the wilderness is, right? It's not dramatic. It's not exactly dangerous. Um, and this one is one of my favorites. And I don't know if you guys do this trick, but if you ask people to describe what they see in this painting um, without knowing what the title is, it seems like a beautiful, idyllic vision of the wilderness that's just existing out there on its own. But then when you look at the title and it says Good Hunting Ground, that totally changes your view of what it is. So again, it's this beautiful idyllic scene that's out there for you to go and, um, and shoot the animals, uh, reap the bounty of what America has to offer. And that's reinforced too in the corn cobs 
around the edge of the frame. It's just yeah. so bountiful, right? There's animals and vegetables and minerals and everything. Um, so then that is a good transition to hunting, which is the way a lot of people you know, interacted with the wilderness, especially on the East Coast. Um, you can talk about these beautiful uh, still lifes that we have that are examples of today's take. So that's kind of the civilized Eastern vision of the wilderness. Um, and then you get over here where we're really talking about exploring the West. And so these are a little bit, a little bit rougher, not as finished or as polished as those. And that is because primarily you've got George Catlin, self-taught artist, and John Woodhouse Audubon, the son of John James Audubon, who went out fairly early into the West up the Missouri River, and then came back and tried to translate what they saw for people back East and in Europe. And for them, the, in, the impetus was not necessarily uh, conveying a beautiful scene like that, but it was uh, presenting information. Like, this is what a mule deer looks like. We all know that's not what a mule deer really looks like, but uh, <laughs> that's what a grizzly bear looks like. And then this, um, Tish and Ramsey Peel uh, went out west even before Catlin or um, Ottawa. Um, he went out on one of the first expeditions, uh, 1819, the long expedition. And we have a really nice tiny watercolor from that expedition, but we can't show that all the time. So this is a painting he did later in life um, based on his experiences out in the West. So exploring the West, you got people going out, bringing their info back to the East. Um, but then you still have some of these, after the early explorer artists, you get a next generation who are then painting the West a little bit more like what we saw over here. This is a more uh, refined vision. Again, beer stats over here, manifest destiny, what's out there for people to experience, uh, to explore, to colonize. And again, there's no, um, there's no troubling other peoples out there any of these paintings. It's just wilderness with creatures for you to experience. Um, the bounty of American wilderness. Uh, William Jacob Hayes has even put some berries in here, some beautiful flowers, along with these short-eared uh, rabbits. So you have this really nice uh, Manifest Destiny-influenced vision for much of the uh, 1800s, up to the middle of the 1800s, late 1800s, but after settlers had slaughtered 60 million bison and we had relocated and killed most of the Native American population, there began to be some sadness over what uh, we had done. And so kind of transitioning in this part of the wall from that to the sadness, as I've been calling it. So this is um, a great painting of the kind of mythological Wild West, the drama, the adventure, etc., that can happen out on the plains. This is really something that happened, a prairie fire, and there's all kinds of cool <laughs> things you can talk about. But you could also interpret this as, um, metaphorically, uh, the fire could be the settlers moving across the plains, burning everything and then driving everything out away as they uh, progressed. So there, you can interpret this in a number of ways, I would say, um, but you can also use it as you're kind of turning the corner from hopeful manifest destiny to mournful and sad, which is what overcame uh, much of the art, again, after all the bison were gone um, and the landscape had largely been conquered by the settlers. Um, so you start to get more and more things like this, which is one lonely, sad bison with the sun setting and a fire happening in the background. So this is a fairly mournful uh, painting that talks about this era um, after the West had largely been settled. Um, you also have this, the lost buffalo calf. Um, which is a pretty sad painting. There's, um, this is a, a group of hunters who have been out, and teeny tiny back there is uh, bison has been killed, and they're skinning it, 
and presumably that's the mother of this calf. Um, calves would imprint on the horses or the people who had killed their parents, and then they would follow the hunters back to camp. This is one way that we were able to save some of the bison because they were easy to uh, make, keep uh, and protect. Um, so that's, a, again, sadness, sadness. And then this one's kind of the most explicitly um, sad and is like the rungus painting out in uh, Johnson Hall. Just how many, this is called How Many Millions One Can Only Guess. How many millions of these bison at that point did we kill? You can only, we don't even know um, at that point. So this was uh, came out with an article in 1905 in the Saturday Evening Post, and it was arguing that it would have been much better if we had sort of harnessed the bison as a food supply um, rather than killing all of them. So, all right, what do you do with this trajectory? You've got um, manifest destiny, hopefulness, excitement, adventure, and then um, some sadness. What do you do after that? People don't stop going into the wilderness. People still appreciate it, love it. Um, use it as a site of recreation, rejuvenation, etc. So you, um, but it's also a place of nostalgia for what used to be. So we've got this great little painting by Grace Carpenter Hudson. Um, she painted very nostalgic images, but of a, a tribe of people that she actually got to know. Um, so she's painting a way of life that now is relegated to a small corner of Northern California not to what it once was. Um, so nostalgia, recreation. Uh, Carl Rungus is a great example of what, how was the wilderness used um, after all this had happened. There's still great pockets of, of wilderness out there, great wildlife out there. And so hunting, again, was a way that people experienced um, the outdoors, and Rungus was certainly among those uh, people. Charlie Russell is known as great chronicler of the West that was. Um, so again, nostalgia, but he throws a little some humor in there. So we're uh, experiencing the West and the wilderness in different ways at this point. Um, so these are obviously kind of humorous, fun sculptures. Um, and we'll keep going with the paintings, and then if we have time, we'll come back to the plots. But we do want to spend time with the Jared Harris paintings, so. Um, and then I would love it if I want to try to look up what kind of camera that is, and that would probably help us date this uh, painting more specifically. But this painting is called uh, The Surprise or Real Adventure. So, again, it's experiencing the out of doors and the wilderness as a uh, recreational mecca, as a fun place to go and visit, um, as a place that offers you, just like those early Eastern scenes, a respite from your urban existence. So these guys are on a fun canoe trip, and the real adventure, you probably heard me say this before, there's the reels on the film camera, and the reels on the fishing rod back there. Um, and so, again, and a little humor added into that. And then this is fun, Struggle for Existence. 1947, it seems like really late date for this kind of piece to be uh, painted. Um, but talking about that ongoing kind of myth that you saw over there as the West, as this great place of, of drama and adventure, um, of harsh living, um, natural forces, all that kind of stuff comes together uh, in this one on the uh, piece. 